Back in the 70s, board games and improv theater had a baby, and it was called the role-playing game. These games allowed a generation of kids to live out their dreams of slaying dragons and saving kingdoms, all while sitting in their bedrooms and basements. Today, gaming has moved into the cultural mainstream, and role-playing games are back with a vengeance. Join us now as five of these former kids come out of the basement and onto the internet to experience adventure, mystery, and obscure pop culture references. It's time for Roll for Combat! Hey everyone, welcome to Roll for Combat. I'm your GM and host, Stephen Glicker. And in this special episode, I sit down with Paizo Creative Director, James Jacobs, and we discuss the new Pathfinder 2nd Edition Adventure Path, Age of Ashes. In addition, we go off on a myriad of topics and talk all about the 2nd Edition rules, some of James's favorite things he's created over the years, what it takes to create an adventure path, what it's like to write an adventure path when they're still developing the rules, and even how his own home campaign developed and shaped the world of Galarian as we know it today. In addition, if you like what you hear, we're going to be having several more interviews posted throughout the next two weeks leading up to Gen Con. So make sure you stick around and keep checking the Roll for Combat podcast. We're going to have at least two to three more interviews released before Gen Con. In addition, not only do we have our actual play podcast where we've been playing through the Dead Sons Adventure Path for, well, almost two years now... But we are going to be starting a brand new podcast with a brand new set of players and characters. That's right. We are going to be playing through the new Pathfinder 2nd Edition adventure, The Fall of Plague Stone by Jason Bowman. Expect to see the first episode of that podcast on August 1st, the first day of Gen Con. So again... Make sure you stick around, subscribe to the podcast, and also check out the Discord channel at discord.ruleforcombat.com where we're going to be starting up a ton of Pathfinder 2nd Edition and Starfinder Society games on our Discord channel right at the start of Gen Con. So with that, sit back, relax, and enjoy the interview. Hey everyone, Steve here. Today I am sitting down with James Jacobs, creative director of Paizo, and we are going to be talking about Pathfinder Age of Ashes Adventure Path. Hello, James. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. I am very excited about this interview because as many people know who listen to the show on a regular basis, we are all about the adventure path. And People who know us know that we've been playing Adventure Paths since Age of Worms, and we play Adventure Paths almost exclusively. First, we did it, well, with our own group, and we went through a lot of the Pathfinder Adventure Paths. There's like 21, 22 of them. We've done maybe, well, now maybe a quarter of them, but we do a lot. We do many more than we probably should, or that's healthy for us. So, of course... The first thing I want to do is get my hands and learn all about the new adventure path for second edition, which is Age of Ashes, uh, Hell Knight Hill by Amanda Hammond. So why don't we jump right into it and you tell me all about this brand new adventure path that we're going to be seeing in just a few weeks. Yeah, it's it's uh, coming out there at Gen Con. Um, it's the first adventure path we've done for the second edition uh, Pathfinder and uh it's, uh, I mean, at one point, it's kind of the same thing that everybody's used to. It's still a giant campaign that'll take your characters through pretty much all the levels. Uh, but there's uh, some new things for the, just the overall structure of the Adventure Pass that we've finally been able to do. Um, one of the really big ones is that with the way that uh, experience points are handled in second edition, we're able to have these Adventure Paths go all the way from first to 20th level. And... Uh, they still have, they're still this, about the same size overall, but uh, just because there's more flexibility in where you can hand out experience points and, you know, whether it's a monster or a fighter, a trap or 
or like a social encounter, stuff like that. We can just get more out there and get all the way to the, the end game, basically, which is which is pretty cool. Do you feel that there's less, quote, padding, if you will? I'm not going to say that sometimes these adventure paths are padded, but I will say that every so often you might be in the fifth book and you feel like, wow, they just added that entire level of a dungeon just to get them from level 16 to 17, and there's almost very little, not no reason, but very little reason to have that. And sometimes when I GM, I'll just say, you know what, uh, uh, you guys just go to level 17. You don't have to kill all these monsters. It's not always for story element. It almost feels like just to get them up to the necessary levels for the next books that they almost put in extra monsters, extra encounters. And you feel maybe hopefully that's less of that. Um, I don't really see it as, pa I mean, so the weird thing about padding is, uh, what one group thinks is padding, the other group will have, that'll be their favorite part of the adventure. It's, it's not really That's true. so That's much true. something that, um, that we put in, I mean, all of the adventure paths, what we do, we have a limited amount of space. We've got like 50, 55 pages per volume, and it's really tough to get all of the, you know, encounters and storyline and stuff we want to get in anyway. So it's not, we don't really ever have a case where it's like, well, we've got 20 pages here that we've got to go from 16th to 17th level or whatever. Let's just throw a bunch of encounters in. It's um, it's really stuff that we try to make everything in there be, you know, uh, load bearing for the plot line. And, um, but at the same point, we understand that it's, it's, a, it's a big thing doing an adventure path, you know, playing every, you know, adventure up through, you know, 17th level is the standard in first edition, the second edition, we're again, going to 20th. And uh, so we try to keep things sort of variety in there. So it's not the same old thing going over and over and over again. So if you had, that's why you see something like in Curse of the Crimson Throne, we've got a lot of urban exploration and stuff like that. And by the time you get to book five, the theory was that people are kind of tired of, you know, exploring cities and maybe they're in the mood for a dungeon or something like that. So we'll throw that in there. But the, the thing is, is that every GM who's running an adventure path uh, can and should make it their own. They they know their group that, that that they're playing with. We don't know who your players are. We don't know what they like, what their preferences are. And uh, you're absolutely right. When you get an adventure path and you get a section that is like, this isn't really something our group is interested in. Uh, let's just level you up past this section and kind of you know do expedite mode or something like that. And then get on with the storyline, the parts that you are actually interested in. Uh, that's really one of the, the great things about uh, you know tabletop gaming is you can completely customize it to your your specific you know interests and your players uh, you know, whatever they they prefer to to do with. Um, it, oh yep, yeah. I was going to say. I mean that also could be just our group because by the time you often get to the fifth or sixth book, you're almost like okay, you want to get to the it's 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 very tricky. You want to get to the big finale, so it's like oh, I have to go through a dungeon and kill twenty guys. All right, come on, just just get through it and just kill them already to get to the big boss and get to the next plot point. So that that could just be our group, perhaps that uh, it's just a little impatient. There's an element of that I think throughout them all because uh, we do publish two a year, and unless you're you know super gung ho gaming like nonstop every day you're not going to be able to keep up with the pace at which we publish them. And so there's always another one like coming out. And if you're, you know, keyed into the adventure path schedule and all that, um, it's really, really easy to get distracted by what's coming up next. I mean, we have that happen too. Rob uh, McCreary is, is I've played in a bunch of games that he's run. And uh, one of the things I joke about is that we always have TPKs like halfway through book two of the adventure path. And in part, you know, that's that's just kind of, you know, maybe bad luck or something like that. But it's got another element of like, we've been playing this adventure path for maybe four or five months already, and, and there's a new one coming up and we want to try that out. So there's nothing really wrong with it. You don't have to play an adventure path all the way to the end, you know, to get your, your money's worth out of it, I say. Um, if you even just read an adventure path and it inspires you to do something of your own later on, it's 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 worth it. So that is a total side, but I want to ask. What do you do if when you get a TPK in book two or book three? How do you guys handle it at your table? <laughs> so um, usually the way we handle it in our table is um, if there's a TPK, that's the end of the campaign. We just start something else, else up usually. Um, I've done them before where uh, it, it really depends on uh, what happens. If you're playing the game and your players are like kind of seem disappointed that there's a TPK, that's a good indication that you should maybe do some stunt to like keep it going. But if people are like, oh, well, maybe now we can start a new adventure path, then it's an opportunity. 
one of my favorite stories that I like to tell is uh, back in um, college, I was running a game and uh, it was, I think it was White Plume Mountain. It was just kind of a one shot where I was like, all right, everybody make, make up just one shot characters. We're going to run through this old volcano dungeon. And they went uh, in there and they got uh, attacked by this vampire and they panicked and were running away from the vampire and did, you know, the, the last ditch stuff, the portable hole into the bag of holding bomb trick, you know, an attempt to, to scare the vampire off. And uh, it backfired, killed them all. The vampire, of course, just went back to his coffin and then came back. And I wasn't really ready to stop playing at that point. So instead of saying that was a TPK, I said that the rather than killing them, it just knocked them out, gave me a chance to do the whole, you're now captured by the bad guys. You have to do their bidding. And uh, uh, they got like put under this quest to, to go take out this like prison and they ended up unleashing these ancient wizards onto the world that rose up from you know their 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 tombs in the past and started doing all this trouble player characters got away from them and what started out as like just a one shot white plume mountain adventure turned into sort of a mini campaign where the player characters were trying to defeat these ancient wizards that rose up from the past and uh, prevent them from taking over the world again and it was a pretty cool plot uh, it ended up having like these new regions start showing up in my homebrew. And uh, then later on, that whole plot line about ancient wizards is something that I drew upon uh, to populate a lot of the, the Rune Lord stuff with Thassalon and all of that. So a lot of the Rune Lord stuff kind of had its genesis in, you know, a one shot TPK. So you never know if a TPK is going to be something big. So a TPK in college is responsible for all the Pathfinder. There you go. You just said it. <laughs> well, the Rune Lord's part of Pathfinder, at least. Okay, the Rune Lord's part. But I, yeah, I see. I've actually, that's the most common one I've seen. I've even had that happen to myself. It's like a TPK, and then, oh, you're not really dead. You wake up in the prison of the bad guy, and then you got to figure it out. And that's that's often the most fun for both the GM and the player, because you know you know it's seat of the pants time right there for everyone. So yeah, and the the uh, you're all in prison adventure is something that GMs really really love. I'd, back when I was working on Dungeon Magazine, that was a plot that I saw show up all the time, or it's variants like you've been captured, you you're trapped in a cave, this type of thing, and you can't really do that. You can't program that in because players really hate starting an adventure with their established characters with the GM saying, "All right, all your stuff's gone. You're in a hole." You have three sticks and a piece of wire, and that's what you need to do to get out of this giant sprawling prison. But if it happens organically, like during the course of play, and the GM is, you know, able to stay mobile and, you know, kind of ad lib a little bit, those sorts of developments really work out well in in, uh, in home games. So with you guys, you guys just kill everyone off and just say, "Up, oh, well, we got another adventure path that just came out. Let's start the next one." But we got kind of on a tangent. Let's go back to Hell Knight Hill. So why don't you tell oh, right. me a little bit about <laughs> oh, that whole that whole thing about Hell Knight Hill? Because I imagine since this is the first adventure path for second edition, I'm not going to say it's more traditional, but it does sort of have a traditional fantasy feel to it. You don't go too crazy. It's not like you're going to be doing time travel or you know jumping around the galaxy, but why don't you give me a little bit of background of uh, how this uh, adventure is going to play out? Sure. Um, so there's a couple of things with uh, Age of Ashes uh, that we decided we wanted to explore. One of the things we wanted to explore was, since it was a new edition, we wanted to do an adventure path where you go to various different parts of the of the uh, inner sea region. You know, kind of do sort of a, a, a world tour so that newcomers to the game can see the difference you know, adventuring areas, themes, diversity, and, and locations and all that. So one of the very early decisions I made was that I wanted each of the six adventures to take place in a different area. Some of them, you know, areas that we haven't done much with, like the first adventure, Hell Knight Hill, takes place in Isgur, which is sort of a, a thrall state of Cheliax right in the middle of the uh, the continent of, of uh, that we've never really done a lot with. So that seemed like a good place to start exploring. But then there's other parts later on where we go to Ravenel, uh, Catapesh, places we have done Adventure Pass before. So we really, really mix it up. Um, so that was one element we wanted to cover in it. Uh, the other one was uh, we've had a lot of people asking us for a dragon-based Adventure Path. And uh, while we've had adventures like dragons show up as, as like key characters in the Adventure Paths before, they're almost always like, 
the penultimate bad guy or the bad guy's best friend or the monster that is at the end of the fifth adventure instead of the sixth. We've never had one where the dragon is the main threat throughout the entire adventure path. And in part, that's because dragon storylines are kind of tough. They're all sort of basically, it's a big monster that is causing trouble. And you can't really have like a, uh, like a CR24 dragon show up easily throughout the entire course of a campaign. It starts getting repetitive. So we just really never had an idea of how we wanted to do a full adventure path. And uh, we figured that out, I think, pretty well with uh, Age of Ashes, with uh, dragon themes kind of being on and off throughout the entire thing. Um, there's definitely one main dragon that is uh, a troublemaker that you're going to have to deal with. Uh, there's also lesser dragons that you know you encounter. You can either fight or you can ally with or whatever works out best for your group. Uh, um, just overall having dragon themes and, and, and the age of ashes is referring to this like ancient, uh, legacy back during earthfall when, when, uh, the world of Galarian went through its kind of shift between the ancient world and the modern one with this, this, po this, this cataclysmic uh, meteor fall event, a manifestation of the dragon God Dayhawk shows up in that tumultuous time and just starts wreaking havoc with these dragon storms, which are kind of like a storm that it combines all of the five breath weapons of the evil dragon. So they're like lightning storms with blizzards and fire tornadoes and like acid rain and poison clouds and all that. And so part of the plot is that you're trying to untangle this, this sort of conspiracy that slowly spreads out as you go to these six different locations and, uh, hopefully stop a new age of ashes from scouring everything that you want to, you know, live in. You don't want to live in a place that's been burned and poisoned and frozen and all of that. So something else I noticed reading through this adventure is that you always have to start off a new adventure path with goblins from what I can tell. And of course, well, what we have in the that's, beginning, that's, goblins. that's not necessarily true. We, we started rise of the rune Lords up with goblins back in the day, because uh, we really wanted to launch a uh, pathfinder with, a combination of like safe old stuff. Like everybody knows what a goblin is, even if you've never heard of a role-playing game. But we also wanted to make, you know, our own spin and kind of like see, because at that point, goblins were like kind of, nobody really paid attention to them. They're, they're monsters that, you know, you just kind of fought in, in dungeons and never really thought about. And we wanted to make them memorable. And we did a really good job with that. And so with a second edition, with goblins being one of the core ancestries that people can play, they're doing this really this really important shift from being monsters that you fight to characters that you actually play. And so with the uh, hell Knight Hill, one of the things we wanted to do was to introduce goblins, not as monsters you fight, but as creatures that you can maybe ally with. They're still kind of, you know, weird, sketchy little pyromaniacs, but they're not always the types that are just trying to destroy things, everything all around them. Um, that also brings uh, me to another organizational theme for age of ashes too, is, in uh, second edition Pathfinder, there are six core ancestries. There's goblins, of course, which we've been just talking about, elves, dwarves, humans, halflings, and gnomes. And uh, you've got half elves and half orcs, which are sort of a subset of, of human. But So you've got these six core ancestries. And it struck me as I was starting to work out the, uh, the plots and everything for Age of Ashes that we've also got six parts to Age of Ashes. So I decided that I wanted to have each adventure kind of have one of those core ancestries as part of its theme. Not necessarily something that would drive the entire plot, but something that when you play through, you're like, oh, yeah, this is the one where goblins had a role. The second adventure you go down into, um, there's slight spoilers going on in here, so I'll try to keep them pretty big. But the second adventure, you go down to the Milwaukee Expanse and you uh, have some adventures with the Kuja elves and so forth and so on. There's there's themes throughout all, all six parts with all of the uh, core ancestries. So, yeah, there's definitely uh, some goblin stuff going on in the first one, but it's... I guess more front loaded than you'd see in burnt offerings. The goblin stuff really happens in the first third of the adventure. And then after that, it's really down into like exploring a castle and, and finding out weird stuff going on in the dungeon below. Yeah. The, I didn't even think about that, but that's actually pretty cool. I like that concept of that. Each ancestry is being explored in each book. I, I always like when you have themes like that, where you almost indirectly have something to look forward to as a player. It's almost like an Easter egg with, Without being an eater egg, it's uh, it's something you obviously plan for, but then it's something that everyone can look forward to, both the player and the GM. Yeah, it's it's something that I really think is important to an adventure path because you got this six part thing that has got you know haunted houses and castles and dinner parties and ship combat and also they've got all sorts of different things going on in there. But you want to have 
DNA, I guess, running through the entire thing that is helps tie it all together. And using themes like that is really something that that I, I can I can use to give something its own personal feel. Like for Rune Lords, for example, the number seven is is pretty important with the seven deadly sins and the seven types of magic and the seven different Rune Lords and their seven swords of sin and all of those other elements. The number seven is really important in that adventure path. Giants are another, the scale of, of foes is another thing in Return of the Rune Lords. You start out fighting goblins and then each adventure, you go from goblins, then to ghouls, then to ogres, then to, then to stone giants. And then until you finally get up to like these enormous rune giants that are just thundering around and um it really it's it's fun it's a fun little like kind of storytelling puzzle to figure out themes that you want to include in adventure paths so one thing i also noticed in this adventure path and just in the writing in general is that my group does rules as written to the point that if it's not an adventure path they don't want it and i mean they do everything that's the way they like to play and that's a big theme on the boards, as you're probably aware. It's like, no, rules is written. Whatever it says is what we have to do. But you, for the first time, actually, I can remember, is that it actually says right in the adventure that uh, this is the rule, but if you don't like this rule, just do whatever you want. You can just change it up. Like, you, you don't allude to it. You actually say that out loud with some of the, uh, again, I'm not going to go into spoilers, but there's some ethical questions in this adventure and it goes ahead and says oh if you don't want to deal with this ethical quandary just don't and even oh, you're talking about certain uh pair of puppies aren't you oh the puppy problem maybe the puppy problem maybe <laughs> no, not that there's anyway people yeah the puppies are fine no don't worry don't worry about puppy, puppies but no, you're right. That's there's there's two other elements to the uh second edition venture pass that I'd like to talk about. One of them you just brought up is empowering the game master one of the things that frustrates me about uh something that kind of when third edition came out to back up a little bit i think that how they quantified all of the rules and skills and everything in the world has uh, rules for how you resolve it i think was was a great great innovation and it really helped make things a lot more you know balanced and and fun but it also created this sort of mindset that if the rules are written down, then the, the GM is no longer the one who runs the game. The books run the game. And if the books run the game, the GM doesn't have the power. And the players can say, can, there's all, almost this element of, of in some you know tables or internet threads or whatever that the players are using the rules as written um, or even the rules as you know maybe some, not all rules are equally well written, for example. They use them as almost like weapons against the GM, it feels like, to, to kind of force situations and all that. And with Path, the second edition Pathfinder, we really are trying to get a lot of that power back into the GM, make the GM a actual, you know, a master rather than just a, a bystander. And uh, by putting stuff like that into the adventure paths, actually writing it in, like if you don't want to do it this way, you can do it that way, or you can make up your own thing. It's, it's our attempt to really give GMs, I guess, permission to, to run the game that they want to play. Um, there's another element, too, that we're doing with Adventure Pass and uh, standalone adventures now is uh, the addition of an adventure toolbox. Uh, we already have these in Adventure Paths uh, in the form of the bestiary. Every single Adventure Path has like a, a section of like six or seven, four to seven new monsters. In second edition, that best area is expanding. That's where you're going to be finding a lot of the NPCs that show up in the adventure. But it's also going to be where you're going to be finding things like new spells, new archetypes, new magic items, new feats, new um, player options, basically, that you can't really just pick when you're building your character. You have to find them and, and earn them and discover them through the course of play, either by you know finding a, an ancient old uh, magic sword and a treasure or making friend with a group of... Um, you know, thieves that teach you secret feats that you can use later on or talking with somebody who has like a, a unique duelist fighting style to to teach you a new archetype. It's really something that um, plays with the second edition game's rarity system where pretty much the bulk of what you see in the core rulebook, those are common rules. Those are the, the baseline of everything. You get down into things like uncommon and rare rules. Those are things that you either have to find in the game or the GM has to specifically put into the game for you to play with. And it's hopefully going to help combat this element of rules creep that you saw in late first edition, where there's so many rules that it's, it's just super intimidating to, to start a new game. Yeah, I actually was going to mention that, is that because of the modularity of Pathfinder 2nd edition, it, you can really mix and match feats and abilities, 
really easily. And I did notice that, I don't know if it's in any of the future um, Adventure Path modules, but in um, the Fall of Plague Stone, there's that in the toolkit where there's new feats that can only be learned as a reward. Like you literally get a reward. Okay, here's new feats and new fighting options and new ways to play your characters, which is awesome. Like that is a big change from first edition. And I really like that a lot because now people aren't just going to be worried about, oh, what treasure do I get? But now it's like, wait, I can play in a way that is completely outside the rules and is something unique that's an actual reward. Now, that's that's really empowering, and that's something I think a lot of player characters are going to like a lot. Yeah, that's going to be the the status quo for our adventures going forward. We didn't really have much of that in uh, the first two volumes of The Adventure Path, and that was just out of necessity because we had to inv- we didn't have the rules at that point. You know, we didn't have uh, mastery over how to like do new feats and stuff like that. The, the design team was still working on making the, the core rule book itself. Uh, Fall of Plague Stone had the advantage of being written by the lead designer at Paizo, Jason Bullman. So he already knew what was going on and was able to include a bunch of feats and art and stuff like that in Fall of Plague Stone. Um, by the time you get to book three in Age of Ashes, uh, Tomorrow Must Burn, written by Ron Lundin. Um, there is going to be stuff. There's like, I think an archetype you can gain access to. There's uh, new feats, uh, some new magic items, and, uh, that's going to keep going forward. Uh, as uh, we continue doing adventure paths, you're going to be basically the idea is that if you pick up a character, like somebody's played all the way through an adventure path and you don't know what adventure path they played in, you should be able to look at their character, look at their treasures, look at their feats, look at their spells, look at their archetypes. You should be able to identify that that person has gone on a specific adventure path. So, for example, if we were doing this with, um, say, Skull and Shackles, you'd pick up a fighter and you'd look at that fighter and you're like, this fighter's got like all sorts of, you know, shipboard combat stuff and water breathing equipment and all that. That's and 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 is you know looks like a, a pirate. It's really a kind of a fun way to kind of not just have your characters built at the start of an adventure path to to fit in, but have your characters evolve along with the storyline pretty dynamically. Oh, yeah. No, that's exactly what I read. And I it took me a second to realize. I'm like, wait, wait a second. I look back in the uh, in the back matter part and I'm like, wait, I'm seeing new abilities. You never see those like or it's very rare. I mean, in how many years of Pathfinder, you might you just never see that. And here it's because it's just so modular. You could easily just add brand new feats and brand new abilities um, without much trouble because it, the whole system or new spells, like you mentioned, it's very modular. It's very, very easy to add these without breaking the system in any way and making it easy for multiple classes to have those feats. It's not like, okay, only rangers can have this feat. It's like, well, no, we're, actually this can work with multiple class types and you could even adapt it if you're a different class type. It's really, I mean, obviously the rules don't come up for a few more weeks for everyone, but when they see how modular and how easy it is to mix and match character abilities, I think people are going to be very excited, especially with the possibility of these as being rewards now. Yeah, I really hope so. And it's, it's, it's a case where it's not so much, we could have done this in first edition. There's, there's no reason why we, we you know, in, inherit to first edition, why we couldn't do it. Aside from the fact that there was no meta of the permissions given in first edition. Uh, there was no rarity uh, to, to feats and spells and all that thing. So if we want, there was this idea that once we publish it, it's out there in the wild and anybody can make it. And, the more things you publish, the more ways you can combine things in ways they were never intended and come up with really outlandish, broken combinations that kind of make everybody frustrated uh, by keeping them kind of, I don't want to use the word quarantined, but that's sort of the right idea. Keeping them quarantined to a specific storyline, you don't have to worry about you know whether or not it's going to interact strangely with other stuff as well. Uh, if it, and it, But at the same point, a GM can still give the players permission to combine them. But at that point, it's the GM making that decision, not having it forced on them from uh, from other people. One of the other um, tricky parts about it, too, is it's 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 not so much a rules uh, change, but it's sort of a philo- philosophical change. Um, before, when we were doing adventures, we'd, we'd hire the adventure writer to basically just write the adventure. And, and the idea was that you would just write, you know, the, the storyline and the encounters and all that. And that was it. Um, going forward, we're going to be asking adventure writers to do a lot more work, really. It's, it's when you write an adventure for, for, uh, 
Paizo, you're going to have to write the, the storyline. You're going to have to also write some feats and some new monsters and some treasures and some rules content that is tied into the storyline. And uh, that's going to that's proven to be pretty tricky to to have happen. And in a lot of cases, it's something that uh, that, that we have to kind of combine together during development. There's there's like you know if, if somebody writes an adventure but they just don't have the time or interest in writing a bunch of spells, and you get somebody else to write those spells for that volume. Then during development, you have to basically tie those two together and make it look like they were always meant to be together. Yeah, that actually leads me to a more general question of how adventure paths are made. Because one of the issues I've had with some of the earlier adventure paths is that you could definitely tell that they were written, you know, six different people, six different outlines, and they didn't always flow together quite so well. And that's some of the earlier adventure paths right around Iron Gods. It really gelled. Iron Gods is probably one of my favorite adventure paths is that it's actually like a trilogy. It's like books one and two have a central theme and storyline and big bad and then three and four and then five and six. It's 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 actually very, very well structured. And so it's like, OK, the big overarching story is books one through six. But then there's these mini stories that's sort of a trilogy. And then each book has its own big bad. So you have like short term, medium term and long term goals. And it really, really moved the adventure along very well. And I'm seeing that more in the newer adventure paths. And so I just wanted to know, like, this is an obviously something that you're very much aware of to try to, and it sounds like you're taking steps to make sure that these adventures for Pathfinder 2nd Edition really s flow smoothly together, that they're not written in, uh, like, you know, that these adventures aren't written by six different authors that don't understand what the prior author did or what the prior adventure encountered. I remember there was one, I can't remember which adventure path there was, but you went through the, oh, there was Kingmaker, that you can go through the entire adventure path and there wasn't a single thing for a rogue to do from beginning to end. Like, everyone just forgot the rogue. And... You know, everyone's like, oh, yeah, whoops, we kind of forgot about that. And, you know, it's, it's you know, if you're playing an adventure path for several years, you really want to make sure you have something for everyone to do. So I just wanted to know more from a, you know, from a from your job point of view, like how you set that up and make sure that, A, these adventures all go smoothly into each other. And B, you start hitting the notes to make sure that everyone has a spotlight within the adventure itself that the GM doesn't have to go in and like retool it. It's really something that uh, we just have to keep track of, uh, and and I think that it's it's interesting. Kingmaker was uh, you mentioned Kingmaker and the Rogue, and that's I mean that's the first time I've ever heard that rogues had nothing to do in in that adventure path. I could see that if you were building, say, a rogue that is that is very focused on on disarming traps and stuff like that, because there's not a lot of trap dungeon exploration in Kingmaker. One of the things we we try to do with with so there's two there's two there's two elements that you're talking about here. One of them is player expectation. And that's really what we make the the player guides for these adventure paths for. If you aren't using a player guide, you're going to really run the risk of building a character that just doesn't work for an adventure path, you know? Um the 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 player guides have a certain amount of like spoilers to the plot, but they're necessary. They let you know, for example, if you're building for for Skull and Shackles, for example, if you want to build a character that's like a, a heavy armor wearing cavalier who rides around on a horse, you're not going to have a lot of fun in an adventure path that's all about sailing around on ships because you're never going to be able to ride your horse. And if you fall off your ship, you're going to sink to the bottom of the ocean and die. So it's really important for, for GMs and players to, to look at those, those player guides and, and kind of go in eyes open what sort of character builds are really appropriate for an adventure path. But there's also the element of... Um, actually organizing the entire adventure path itself. And the way we do that, it's it's a constant learning process. We'll do one, uh, then uh, two years later, we'll get some good feedback about uh, how it works and be able to apply that to the next adventure path we're doing. But in the meantime, we've done three other adventure paths that we're waiting for feedback on. So it's sort of this time delay thing of uh, getting actual feedback from, from people who've played them. But uh, we do build pretty in-depth uh, outlines for adventure paths these days. An outline for an adventure path generally runs about 20,000 words. That's about, if we were to publish in an outline, it would be about a 32-page uh, product. And it contains all of the details for like the back matter and the storyline and uh, the history and everything, details on each adventure, what sort of monsters get out, get in there, and then all of the people who are writing them basically have to look through that and write the adventures uh, to that spec. Um, 
we're starting to more and more use things like Discord and 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 uh, uh, other group uh, um, programs that allow authors to to chat with each other during the the process of writing. But really, it's the job of the main developer of the adventure path to once the adventures come in, then you have to go through and adjust the text, rewrite the text in some cases to make it sound like it's all one person and one one cohesive storyline from start to finish. And uh, that's a tough job to pull. Um, one of the tricky things that uh, happens is that we've gone through different adventure path developers just through the, the, the just natural evolution of who's working where at Paizo and all of that. So you'll get somebody, you know, like I'll do three or four adventure paths, but then I'll move on. And then Rob McCurry comes in and starts doing them. Or then um, Wes Schneider comes in or Patrick or Ron or Crystal. And each time they do that, somebody comes in, they, they kind of have to start from scratch. Um, we do try to pay forward all of the institutional knowledge on how to build an adventure path, but everybody kind of has their own sort of method of, of bringing it all together into one. And um, it's this slow kind of, I don't want to say it's two steps forward, one step back thing, but it's this case of like, we slowly are, are getting better and better, I think, with each adventure path we do and how the, the storylines work together. So hopefully Age of Ashes will, uh, and uh, Extinction Curse as well, will will bear the fruit of having over a decade of, of practice doing these things. So it's a, is it true that you kind of try to set up these adventure paths that you have one traditional one and then one non-traditional one so it's sort of you alternate back and forth between each uh, each one not necessarily traditional but you know you have one that's more experimental if you will yeah that was sort of the idea that um if you do an adventure path that's like you were saying earlier uh that an adventure path will take most groups uh months and months to play out and um if an adventure path comes it takes six months for just them to publish and so we wanted to make sure that uh, we we give a wide range of options to adventure paths, but we also understand that the ones that are the most popular are the ones that are basically the most, you know, standard fantasy because you always got new players coming in and they see the the basic rules as set up in the core rulebook and they want to play with the familiar. They want they want they they enjoy things like you know what you see in Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones. You know the kind of European. Uh, fighting zombies and dragons and stuff like elements. So uh, we do try to go back to that kind of uh, comfortable um, standard for fantasy. But the, I think what also we've been seeing is that when we do things like Iron Gods or Skull and Shackles or some of the more you know outlandish, uh, really heavily themed adventure paths, people really respond to them quite well. So I think going forward, we're going to see us get a little bit more experimental. Well, I mean, we're already doing that with second edition. Back in first edition, you could look at the the first several adventures we did. We did Rise of the Rune Lords, which was pretty standard, you know, fantasy. We did Curse of the Crimson Throne, which had a, a strong urban theme, but it was still not that outlandish. Uh, Second Darkness is the same thing. It's it's like drow and dungeons and stuff like that. It wasn't really until um, Legacy of Fire, where we started getting to like this Arabian Nights theme, where we moved away from the European Eurocentric kind of themes. With um, Second Edition, we're certainly starting back at that, where you, you can't get much more classic than fight dragons and, and defend the castle from the dragons and all of that stuff. But then the very next one, Extinction Curse, all the player characters are members of a traveling circus. And that's pretty outlandish, just right from the start. So I think you're going to be seeing in Second Edition a lot more, I guess, focused I, I don't want to say experimental but but non-standard storylines going forward i know that the third one which we haven't yet announced i think we're announcing it coming up in a few weeks at gen con has its own kind of really fun theme that is something we've never done in an adventure path before yeah for our group we've been playing so i mean we've been playing over 40 years so for us we like the experimental ones quite frankly it's like you know the Traditional ones are fine and all, but we've 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 done it. You know, like that was our formative years. Those were our college years, you know. And if you think about it, the ones that we always still talk about to this day is Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, um, White Plume Mountain, you know, like all the all the S modules, like all the crazy ones. You know, of course, you know, we'll we'll talk about the basic uh was it against the giants or you know, some of the more traditional meat and potatoes modules but it's really the outlandish ones that we still talk about and remember to this day and those are the ones we're really most interested in and i will say when it's when 
I was playing Pathfinder in the beginning, the one that really opened my eyes, of course, is Richard Pett, because Richard Pett's insane. But the Sixfold Trial in the uh, in Council of Thieves, that was when, okay, that's when I really saw the craziness or the, let's say, the um, what you can do in an adventure path or an adventure that you can't normally do. For those of you who don't know, I mean, this is an old adventure and I'm not spoiling anything. It came out 10 years ago, but a big part of the adventure is you have to put on a play and the play, you can die during the play. And that's one of the coolest aspects of any adventure I've ever seen. I mean, Richard Pett often has these very outside the box adventures in his, uh, in his adventures. And this was one of the first times I really saw that outlined in a Pathfinder adventure. And since then have kind of always gravitated towards that. Yeah, that's definitely uh, a great example. We do, we do still try to make sure that we do. I don't think we we, we do like two or three extremely outlandish adventure paths in a row, but I think we're going to start mixing up, but, but the, but the back and forth, like one standard, one experimental, that's kind of the safe um, traditional way to go about it. That way, you know, there's always, there's always something, hopefully there's always something for everyone, but at the same point, I do, do value, you know, doing new things that even because, you know, you mentioned you've been playing them for, for like decades. Uh, I've been writing them for decades and in order to keep myself interested, it's it's important for me to to want to work on adventure paths that even when they're kind of going back to the the basics, that there's still interesting new stuff going on in them. Like for Age of Ashes, on one level, it's like this is the adventure path where you fight dragons. Um, and uh, there's lots of dungeon stuff going on, but there's also elements of like you you get a castle in the first adventure, and and sort of one of the themes is during the course of the rest of the uh, the campaign, you're kind of rebuilding and making this castle your your base of operations. There's also a couple of elements later on where it's like there's a lot of political stuff where you're you're trying to talk with a bunch of guilds and organizations and getting them to help you out by doing favors for them and influence them. So there's a lot of social political stuff going on. Um, so there is some new elements going on in there. There's not <laughs> nothing. Well, I take it back. There is there is a pretty involved, unusual heist coming up in the later part of the adventure in Age of Ashes. That is kind of it's it's pretty ingenious the way uh, it, it the way the author has uh, built it up. I don't want to say who it is because it's sort of a spoiler, but uh, it'll it'll be something that I think people will be talking about. Yeah, one of the things about Pathfinder Second Edition is that. And you kind of mentioned this. I actually totally for, forgot about that whole aspect of like managing a castle. Is that the rules take up much less space, especially in the adventure paths. So you have more space to write about cool aspects of new rules and new you know features and new ways that you can play the game, and don't have to worry about explaining the mechanics of the rules because. Again, it's it's hard to explain without knowing the rules, but it's very modular, so it's almost like keywords. Uh, one of the examples I like to use is Magic the Gathering, is that there's a lot of keywords in Pathfinder, so you can just throw some keywords and say, this uses the attack rules, and that's it. That's all you need to do is you literally just have one keyword, attack, and then you don't have to go through all the rules about how attacks work and so forth. You know that this is keyed off attacks, or this is a... Um, chaotic monster, so it's keyed off chaotic. So you can really condense the rules to very small size and then worry about, as I said, the meat and potatoes, sort of the, the cool sizzle factor of like how to manage a castle without having to go into extreme details of writing these entirely new rule systems that take up pages and pages that are so precious inside of Adventure Path. Yeah, that's uh, one of the reasons why we're able to go to 20th level is that the rules are more concise. They're less, you know, cumbersome to, to work with. And you don't have to repeat a lot of stuff going on every time you do stuff. That They're they're really a lot more flexible and uh, just less, I guess, less more. It's less like you're writing a computer program and more like you're writing a script for people to read and understand. So it's it's kind of, it's, it's pretty liberating. And uh, uh, it's it's makes Adventure Pass a, a bit more, Adventures a bit more fun to write, honestly. Yeah, no, I thought so too. I felt like stat blocks were much smaller, rules explanation were shorter, like, you know, you really got more into the background with characters and the story of what happened in the location. And, you know, you really got into, as you said, the script writing. So it's, 
I would almost say like old adventure paths would be like, I don't know, almost like 40% mechanic, 60% adventure of the actual, like, you know, scripting of the adventure and the, the actual plot and details. But now I feel it's more like almost like 80% plot and details and 20% mechanics. If even that high, it might even be like 15%. It's way, way smaller now. Cool. I think that's interesting too, because I, there's mechanics in there, but they're just, they don't feel like mechanics when you read them or play them as part of the problem. There's more mechanics than like 10, 20%, but they're, they're part of the storyline. And um, one of the ways that second edition uh, functions is it's three modes of play. You've got the um, encounter mode, which is the standard that everybody knows about. That's like roll initiative, then fight the troll and and pick up its loot and go on to the next encounter and, and basically encounter by encounter uh, play. Um, there's exploration mode, which is a fact. It's like when you're doing like mass travel or, or shopping in a city or that type of thing where there's that plays out not in the course of seconds, but over the course of hours. And then there's downtime mode, which is something where it's like this is where you're just taking days to to research magic items or or build things or uh, run a business or stuff like that. It's these three different modes of play have rule support in the core rulebook. They're right there built into the baseline assumption of the game. And as a result, when we have adventures, say, that have a section where um, you've got to rebuild a castle or you've got to like do a bunch of investigation into like an old mystery or you've got to you know do a lot of overland travel, we don't have to spend pages and pages in the text to, to say how, to, how it works. We just create these new basically downtime or exploration activities for you to use in the game. And it's a lot more convenient and a lot more fun. Oh no, yeah, I I love the the new rules personally. I think it's, I mean, I'm a computer programmer at heart, and I read it. It's funny you said it was not like in computer programming. I actually disagree with you. It's exactly like a computer program because it's very modular. It's very easy to cross reference that you don't have to outline every single thing. As you said, you can say, okay, you're now in exploring mode, and using the exploring mode tool set, this is how this works, and here's new features and new activities that you can now do. And you can just throw it in there. And they know exactly how it works because exploring mode has its own rule set that's very simple. And then you could just add new activities for people to do. And that's it. You don't have to go into, okay, here's three pages to explain how you're supposed to explore. That's already done for you. So it allows you, again, to concentrate on the fun aspects and not the, um, you know, the, the rules aspects and only the rules aspects. Yeah, there's less having to reinvent the wheel every time you want to do something that's not a fight. So Extinction Curse, see, I want to talk about that, but I know you don't really work on that one so much because I developed for that one. I did Legacy of the Lost God. I did the Back Matter Monsters for that one. So I want to play that one, and I don't even know that much about it. I'll tell you a secret. If you're developing for it, it's like it's like working on... um. It's a, it's a, it's like working on an HBO or it's, it's like working on a top secret movie. Like they just give you the pages that you work on and that's it. They don't tell you anything else. So I know very little about this adventure, even though I worked on it. I just know the monsters I created. But I tell you, what was it like creating all these modules and this adventure path without the rules? Because I had to create just a couple of monsters without the rules. And that was hard. So I can't even imagine what it was like to create everything without the rules. It was it was pretty tricky. I mean, on one level, we we really want the stories that we tell in second edition to be the same type of stories we tell in first edition. If you can't run a first edition adventure path using the second edition rules, or you can't run a second edition path using the first edition rules because the stories just don't work, then we screwed up. So by writing, having the authors basically wrote the first six or the first all the adventures for um, Age of Ashes, they wrote using either first edition rules or the or the playtest rules or a combination. And uh, then it was basically my job and uh, the design team's job to go through and make sure the rules work for the the new system. And uh, it was it was pretty pretty tough uh, trying to get it to to work. Get all of the uh, the numbers. To, the the really tricky thing was to make sure like just the DCs for skill checks and stuff like that would work out. Um, it's, it's, uh, so much of the core rules are about building characters and building, you know, you, 
building your characters and uh, and and the the actual interaction of fighting and all that, the element of like here's how to actually build the rules is not so much part of the core rules. And that's that's something that I had to go talk with the design team about and how to get that all going. A lot of those rules are going to end up in the game master guide later in the year. Um, so uh, GMs who want to make their own games will really want to grab that book when it comes out to you know start mixing and matching and doing their own thing. But uh, yeah, it was tough. It's there was a, a pretty much for the last six or seven months there was like not a lot of vacations, not a lot of uh, a lot of long long hours, a lot of stress and stuff like that. So hopefully it was all worth it. But your next adventure path will be much easier because now you actually have the rules, right? Like this is almost done. You're almost you're almost you already have what the first two printed up, the next three or four are in the can, right? So you're you're almost done with this one. Yep, yep. So with Extinction Curse. What's going on? Like, so all I know is traveling circus. That's all I know. And that's, that's enough for me. I was like, I'm traveling circus. You got me sold. Like, that's how easy that one is. I, I was curious uh, what the, <laughs> what the uh, meeting was like. It's like, we have an adventure idea, traveling circus. Okay. Done. You guys sold me. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's such, it has such a, there's so much you could do with that. It's like, you got freak shows, you got, like ah, it's just so much. I can't even imagine where you start. It's it's interesting. It's the traveling circus element was not at the not the first thing we came up with with the extinction curse. Um, one of the things we do with all of our adventure paths is we need to figure out a way. Like what? Why are the these particular player characters going on this journey? Uh, in some cases, it's pretty easy. Like in um, uh, <clears throat> Rise of the Rune Lords, it's because you are the 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 bravest people at the, the ceremony at the start of the town that stood up for the goblins. Uh, for something like uh, Strange Eons, uh, it's because you all were, you know, had your memories uh, abducted and, and showed up in this like asylum. And uh, Serpent Skull, it's because you were the people that survived the shipwreck on the island. There's always got to be this sort of initial binding element. And uh, we kind of tie that in with, with the, the player's guides. Um, with Extinction Curse, the initial bit there was we wanted to explore the Isle of Cortos, uh, the island which uh, Absalom, the biggest city in the inner sea region, is on. It's an island that we've done a fair amount with in now and then in like the organized play program, but we barely touch it in print. And, um, you know, you look at a map of the Isle of Cortos and it's just like one mountain in the middle and like three dots for cities. And it's kind of underwhelming when you look at it on the map and, and, uh, when I started pitching some like locate you know, adventures set on the Isle of Cortos, people are like, there's nothing there. But uh, when you get out your ruler and you measure it, the Isle of Cortos covers like more landmass than like Western Washington. And so you look at like the Olympic Peninsula and Seattle and the Puget Sound region, and there's a lot of locations there that are very diverse and different. And you got volcanoes, you got like oceans, you've got forests, uh, rainforests. There's a lot of stuff you can explore there. And you know, so so it is with the Isle of Cortos. So with Extinction Curse, we are going to be crawling all over the Isle of Cortos, going all over the place, exploring that that ter the terrain there in more detail than we've really ever done before. Um, I don't want to go too in depth into the uh, the plot line of it to prevent spoilers, but basically what's happened is the Isle of Cortos is this island that Aridan rose up from the bottom of the ocean uh, back when he you know became a god and and established Absalom and all of that stuff. Um, so that's an island that was created by magic and extinction curse is looking at what happens if that magic is starting to fail if, or if something is trying to meddle with it, what happens to the island if it just starts falling apart. And, uh, it's to, to sum it up, the player characters who, uh, we decided are, you know, circus carnies are going to have pretty important jobs if everybody wants to, you know, keep their, uh, their houses, uh, inhabitable on the Isle of Cortos. It's funny that you mentioned that because obviously, or not obviously, but I do a lot of Pathfinder Society, and the Isle of Cortos is is very well traveled in in Pathfinder Society. They you that you you do a lot of adventures there, but I guess outside of Pathfinder Society, it's not really um, been explored too much. Now I think about it, and and even in Pathfinder Society, there's there's not. I mean, you go to Diabell, you go to a bunch of different locations, but. Just the nature of a Pathfinder Society scenario, it's four or five encounters. There's not a lot of room to do really in-depth, you know, explorations of large regions. It's just not possible in, in the scope of uh, uh, an organized play adventure, which is, again, four hours long and is meant to be played in a, a 
a very specific format. Um, you can't really do something like we did with Verissia in Return of the Rune Lords, where it's got an entire sprawling region with a bunch of, you know, sandbox elements to it. Uh, that's something that we wanted to explore with Extinction Cards and hopefully, you know, take a lot of the stuff that was established in the organized play stories and all of that and, and give them context. So one thing that's fascinating about Pathfinder is that you have this huge world and I, I kind of think of it almost like World of Warcraft is like, oh, there's this, this is the horror area. Oh, and this is the Egyptian area. And this is the um, Gothic horror area. And this is, you know, every area has its own theme, you know, or, or Disney World, if you will. It's like, oh, here's Frontierland and here's uh, Future World and so forth. And you guys do explore each of those sections. What areas have you not touched on yet that you hope to explore? You don't have to you don't have to commit to anything, but there's definitely several areas I know people want to well for me, I always wanted to do um Numeria, and that was the number one I wanted to do. And then you did. You did Iron Gods, and I was very happy with that. But after that, it's sort of what what areas do you want to see explored that haven't really been touched on in any past adventures? Um, you'll get a different answer for that from everybody at Paizo, and it's it's kind of a... a oh, I realize place. that. Yeah. Yeah, I realize that. But it's it, more it like points to a screen when it's setting. Yeah, and it's 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 intentional, too, because we don't... One of the things we wanted to avoid was what happened with, like, the, the mid-late 90s uh, Dungeons & Dragons era, where they had so many campaign settings that they just kind of fractured their audience, you know? I mean, you'd, you'd be out there looking for a game to buy, and it's like, there's Birthright or Planescape or Ravenloft or Dark Sun or Forgotten Realms or Greyhawk or all of these different options. You only really want to play in one. You don't really want to buy the other ones. So it, it basically divides your audience and it makes it really difficult to to sustain a business. And we all saw what happened with, with TSR as sort of a result of that. Um, so with Galarian, we wanted to just have one campaign setting, but like, as you said, different themes in the area. So we have our horror section, we have our steampunk section, we have our political intrigue section, we have our, you know, all of these different classic methods of play represented throughout the entire area. Um, myself, an area that I've wanted to do, well, I, I still love going back to like Sandpoint and Verissia region and, and have more stories I want to tell there for sure. Um, I'd like to explore, uh, Medio Galti Island with the Red Mantis Society. Hmm. Why is that? Um, because uh, they, the Red Mantis uh, assassins are something that um, that I am exported from my my homebrew setting. There's a lot of backstory going on with them. I love the idea that they're they're evil, but they're not they're not like necessarily bad guy evil. They're the kind of evil that you maybe want to team up with, maybe um depending upon the, the nature of the greater menaces that you've got going on there their island also has dinosaurs on it so that's kind of cool um but uh there's just a lot of storylines that i've got bumping around in my head that that i think would be really fun to explore with that sort of uh organization um it's not something that we really have a plan yet going forward but um I don't know. There's there's so many places you look at you look at the inner sea region and the regions we haven't done something with. There's there's stuff in there. I mean, you look at like Galt. That's something a lot of people have been interested in seeing with this eternal revolution going on. I think there's room there to do a entire kind of um, not necessarily a rebellion, but rebuilding a a shattered nation type adventure path. There's um, the Mana Wastes. We've done one adventure set there, but I yep. think it would be really fun to do something there with like guns and and like mutants and all that type of stuff. So there's a lot of places to go with. Oh, that's what I was getting at, because the ones that I really wanted to see, you you did, thankfully. Uh, Ustalov, which I ran, because I love that. Numeria, which, again, I ran. And the ones I'm kind of interested in is Geb, because <laughs> that is weird. Geb is just totally strange, and I don't think you've really done much of anything with it. And as you said, the Mana Wastes, when that adventure came out a few years ago, I was so excited. I was like, oh, finally the Mana Wastes. And it... Uh, it I don't know. It didn't seem to. It was more adventure and less mana wastes. I mean, I haven't read it in several years, but I was I wasn't as impressed with the uh, feel of the mana waste. It had kind of a feel to it, but it just felt more like an adventure that could have almost taken place anywhere. But yeah, there's well, yeah. so many areas that you guys can still do. Yeah, that adventure mostly took place in Alkenstar and in the regions right around Alkenstar, so it didn't really actually go into the mana race. But yeah, absolutely, there's a lot more we could do in there, and um, I think that. <laughs> 
we're going to be able to go beyond the, you know the borders of the map a lot sooner than this edition too. There's there's places in Garoon that I'm really excited to explore, and places in uh, uh, Kazmaron that uh, you know I'd love to see more stuff in Vudra or stuff in. Uh, there's a nation called Drune in very southern uh, Garoon, which is all about lizard folk and stuff like that. So, or even just going back to to Tian Cha, which we've we've got a lot of information there, but we haven't done much with it. So basically, we're never going to see the end. Uh, it's you just have this one way it's it's just endless it's uh, literally endless but you guys can just have one adventure path for one section and you can probably it'll still take another 30 years to finish everything well i hope so i mean because if if we run out of ideas then you know we're done and you know we go get jobs uh elsewhere and i don't want to do that i love working at paizo so and part of the plot philosophy there is too there's whenever i put something into an adventure and uh, reveal a secret I try to make sure there's two new questions in there. So it's kind of like if you're a, a logger, you don't want to chop down an entire forest and not plant trees for, you know, you to, to work on later in the future. So I wanted to get to a little bit about James Jacobs himself, because you've been around, as you said, a long time. Yes, I'm old. A long time. So I'm looking at your Pathfinder credits here, and they're long, long and extensive. And I see you have a ton of monsters that you created back in the day. What what was one of your favorite monsters that you created for Pathfinder? Mm, wow. Um, so one weird element of all of that is that um, it's it starts to get kind of blurry as to who came up with what idea and uh, who really came up with exactly what monsters were. It's it's really collab collaborative, is what I'm saying. So, um, but that said. I think probably my favorite monster is probably Tree Razor, because um, oh really yeah oh, he's cool. he's um one of the first monsters I made up for my homebrew setting well first big bad villains uh, he's I mean he's a dinosaur demon I mean that's that's pretty much sums James Jacobs up in a nutshell I was pulling him up once again. Let's see, tree razor, 20 foot tall wing, demon, acid dripping axe, two red eyes glow with a tooth filled beak. And yeah, he's, he's really, I mean, demon. <laughs> yeah. CR 25, he's, he's a lightweight. Yeah, he's, I he's, see. He's, he's, a, he's a tough guy. Um, but I, the thing that I really like about him is just I, I've always been fascinated with demons and I've always been fascinated with dinosaurs and just combining that together and making him sort of the type of villain that I would like to see defeated to a certain extent, because I've grew up in Northern California where there's like redwood forests and just nature everywhere. And it's, it's kind of in my blood. And so a demon that is all about corrupting nature is uh, a really, you know, compelling foe to fight against. So that's, that's probably my number one, the, the demon that the creature I'm the most proud of creating, I think. Um, and uh, I'm I'm delighted that he's he's basically the the uh, tentpole bad monster in uh, the second edition best era. He's 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 the second edition Tarask, if you will. Oh really? I didn't even. Huh? I got to look at that again. I didn't recognize. Uh, gonna have to pull that up real quick and take a look. Yep, he's in there. I'll look that up while you're talking. How many of your homebrew campaign ideas get end up inside of uh, Paizo products? It sounds like all. Uh, it's, no, it's not quite all. It's it's a fair amount. About, I'd say, two-thirds of the, the core deities are from my homebrew, for example. Um, a lot of Verissia and Medioculti Island and Kionan and uh, Belkzin are all from my homebrew. But there's just as much from, like, Jason Bullman and Wes Schneider and James Sutter and Eric Mona and all sorts of other... I mean, even now with uh, Luis Loza and Eleanor Farron, uh, heading up the line for the uh, the the new world guides, they've got new regions that they're starting to build in there. So it's really kind of all over the place. But um, it's kind of a weird thing too. Like if if you put something of your homebrew into a shared world like that, it's no longer yours. And so you've kind of got to look at it as a, uh, am I ready to let this go and let other people play with it? So there's parts of um, my homebrew that I have not yet uh, basically sold off to to paizo or or i did some earlier in wizards of the coast way back in the day when i was working on DD stuff um there's a fair amount of stuff that i'm still kind of clinging to and and i don't know what i'm going to do with it at some point it, it keeps creeping out though 
Okay, Tree Razor. I didn't realize this was Tree Razor because Tree Razor has the craziest artwork in the bestiary. I remember this. I was flipping through. I was like, what the hell is that thing? He is insane. The, his stats are off the chart. And then Black Axe alone, the point here it is the weapon used by Tree Razor, a plus four greater corrosive major striking obsidian great axe that is a magic item yeah it's 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 definitely i mean in the first edition it was a pretty powerful um artifact it's it's interesting that it, until you get the rules that role that the context of how the the rules play out is so different that like in first edition plus four isn't as powerful as weapons get but in second edition that's a that's a pretty big deal but uh yeah, it's definitely it's it's tough. He can, he can hit a tree and basically absorb its health and heal himself and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, I don't even think I've seen above plus three because it only goes from plus one to plus three for the standard rule. So anything above that is is well. Yeah, that's artifact is, level, is, right? Artifact level. It's pl a plus four is plus four doesn't exist. That's the first one I can remember seeing. It's yeah, his 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 art is insane. You have the original art. You get the. You, you get that, and like put it in your office afterwards. And you're like, there. That's my monster. It's um. It's kind of weird because uh, a lot of the artists we use these days are um, and they do digital art. So there is not. There isn't really original. It's basically just you know an image, and uh, it's still cool looking. But there's something I I just I guess I'm traditional. I love the fact that Wayne Reynolds, for example, paints all of the paintings he does for our covers on you know just poster board using you know miniatures paints essentially and uh those are things that you can actually pick up and look at and so that's that's just kind of uh, visceral to me um but that is an interesting element of like if you've got all of these things from your homebrew and then you get into a position like i'm in where it's like now i'm putting them into pathfinder books and then you get these amazing artists to illustrate them it's it's pretty surreal seeing that happen because uh I drew a picture of Treeazer back in the day for an adventure I wrote in, in high school or college or whatever it was. And uh, he's pretty much looks the same. He's just turns out that like 18 year old James Jacobs isn't as good an artist as, as other Ben Wooten or whoever is doing illustrations for him in the future. One of these days, I'm going to try to get Wayne to do a tree razor version as well. So we'll see how that works out. So another similar question, because you've written some of the best guides i would say you have here i'm um, looking here numeria land of fallen stars your te technology guide the world wound you have uh information about the red mantis like you you've written a lot of pretty not necessarily famous but let's just say linchpin items in the glaring universe that have become you know something that uh, people have flocked to and uh, other adventure paths and other adventures have centered around. So what was some of your favorite books or material that you've written for Pathfinder over the years? Um, I'm really pretty proud of uh, the, the demon section of the Book of the Damned. Um, that's something that I, I really, taking a lot of the stuff that inspired me about demons back in D&D &D and then giving new spin to it uh, for Pathfinder. But um, uh, I'm also really proud of Burnt Offerings because that was the first adventure path we did for Pathfinder. Um, and uh, it, it's just, it was a rough blaster, right? And I just love, it's been put in, it's been put on like as a play, as a radio drama, as, as, as card games, all sorts of different incarnations. So that one's a, really had an amazing lifespan. Um, I think if I had to pick one thing, it would probably be the Sandpoint book that came out, of, was it last year or two years ago? It's all blurring together. But Sandpoint is, um, something that I'm just really proud of how it's it's all come together. It's it's this sort of sandbox area for you to just explore and, and adventure and all over the place. And uh, there's so many just fun characters to encounter in there in that book. So that's probably the thing that I'm I'm personally the most proud of of working on. Um I guess lately. Yeah, I actually I had that sandpoint book and it, it's very detailed. It's actually beautiful that I, I you don't see a lot of those. It's like a book on just one city with the extensive detail about that city. You know, you see that sometimes in third party products, but I don't think Paizo's really done a lot of that where it's just one city of that much detail. We've done a fair amount. We've done like Magnamar and Corvosa. And, and the, the thing is, is we haven't done a lot on uh, a town the size of Sandpoint you, and they're shorter books. 
So that's what I'm going to say. You've done yeah. them, but those were like 32 page books or something. Yeah. Sandpoint was like 128, wasn't it? That was a big, it was 96. Big the, my original oh, 96. outline. Yeah. My original outline for the Sandpoint book was a 320 page book. And I was having trouble filling, not uh, going over word count in that even. There was a lot of stuff in that 320 page book. Um, obviously, that never came to pass because that's, that's, we have a limited number of heart books that size we can publish in a year. So the 96 page book is, is kind of like the bare bones minimum of Sandpoint. I, well, I guess the 14 or pa 14 page article in Rise of the Rune Lords is the bare bonesest of them all. But, but at 96 pages, I think that I was able to get enough detail in there that people can, can run with it and make it, you know, into their own little kind of, hometown adventuring site that's what i meant is like yeah the, the 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 adventure path guides or the um those did cover cities but those were small this was like i remember getting it i was like well this is a meaty book like this really went into detail and took its time some of the others you feel like you're just getting almost the highlights like a guided tour if you will like a photo's guide <laughs> of all the best sites to see but yours actually went through a lot of detail and uh, went through all the aspects of Sandpoint that you really got to feel like you were part of it. I like that. Yeah, I like that book a lot. I think also uh, one of the things we're changing about our, our release schedule and all that going forward with second edition is that those types of books will be the norm now. Um, in second edition, we had a really breakneck pace of like campaign settings and and player guides and adventure paths and all of this stuff, and it was it was unsustainable to a, to a large extent, and it started. They, they just weren't big enough to do everything we wanted to do with them. So going forward, you're going to see more uh, larger, meatier books like that, which is pretty exciting. But no 300-page books of Sandpoint. That, that's you're going to have to do the extended director's cut, the PDF version, if you will. Maybe. I no, Never say never. There, there may be 200, 300-page books on the horizon that, focus on specific towns or locations or all that. I mean, that's something that we can now do now that we're no longer in this sort of every month we have to do a 64 page campaign setting. Now that we've, we're, we're more mobile, we can basically give products the room and, and the size that they deserve. Interesting. Interesting. Well, certainly I'm, I, I'm trying to be sort of vague. I think we're going to be giving more details out on at Gen Con, of course, in a few weeks, but uh, oh, of course, of course, yeah. I'm not going to, I'm not going to pry you for this information, at least not not on the record. Uh, afterwards, I'll find out all about it. But yes, no, that, sounds, that sounds great. Uh, I can't wait. You know, I am under NDA, by the way. So with that, um, <laughs> so what are you looking forward to? What's your actual favorite? Everyone gets asked this, but I got to ask you, what's your favorite aspect of Pathfinder 2nd Edition? I know everyone says the you know economy system and you know the fighting and how it's three actions and all that that's like everyone's default answer i'm going to do something no one ever does i'm going to tell you my favorite thing and my favorite thing is the modularity of the system and how it's so easy to create a character that you want to create you can really mix and match feats and abilities and make completely unique characters and that you can have 10 fighters and they're not like kind of similar to one another that they can be completely different from one another that you really can see a wide variety of creature and monster types and uh, character types that you just couldn't quite see in pathfinder and really most role-playing games and that you really seem to also have it down is that by keeping all the powers kind of small and not you know too overwhelming compartmentalized if you will that it allows the 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 characters to be greater than the sum of their parts if you will and again it's hard to see once you once you see the rules you understand what i'm talking about but i really like that's my favorite part of the rules yeah that's that's definitely something that's cool i mean i'm probably i'm going to be starting a new campaign an office campaign uh, i think the week after gen con and that's going to be my first really deep dive into actually playing the game rather than just writing for it. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I really, I mean, people always say the three action uh, economy system for resolving all that stuff because it's, it's the fundamental, it's really, really elegant and easy and to handle and all that. So that's, that's a huge element too. Um, but I think my favorite thing, and I alluded to this earlier is that it, the game gives back the, 
agency to the GM, GM. It allows the GM to basically run the game they want to run and that their players want to run without having to worry about everything in, at the table, you know, having to be, you know, balanced or whatever like that. So I think it's just, it, it's sort of a throwback to the earlier edition, earlier um, incarnation of the game where it's like, you want to do something, you have permission basically to make the game what you want to make. I completely agree. The game feels extremely tight without being limiting, which is hard to do, but I feel like you've done it is that, you know, obviously scope creep and, power creep was rampant in pathfinder first edition and it feels like it's going to be very hard to pull that off without jumping through hoops in second edition which i guess for those who are looking for power hungry pcs that break the game well they might be a little disappointed but for everyone else it's going to be refreshing that you can actually play the game and not have to worry about oh i really need this this one item that will give me that extra plus one to hit that that will break this system and make this spell you know bro unbreakable and so forth like it, there's there just seems like there's going to be a lot less of that there's going to be a lot less uh munchkining and power gaming it's like let's just play the game the the rules are very tight it's kind of hard to break the it's kind of hard to go outside the system unless you really want to. And it allows you to concentrate on the fun elements rather than the, Oh, let's try to break the system elements. So it's, it's, uh, it's definitely um, going to make it easier for you to avoid those types of mixes and, and just like un, unintentional, you know, I guess uh, combinations that, that could break the game. But at the same point, the game allows for that to happen. If you, if that's something that your table likes doing, like throwing everything on the table and and seeing just what sort of outlandish creations you can make, it'll still work that way. You just need the GM's permission to do that. And I think that's huge. A GM who enjoys running that type of game where it's like, make the toughest character you can, and then I'm going to see if I can challenge you. That's a perfectly viable way to play as long as everybody wants to play that way. So it's definitely something that is going to, um, I think, GMs and players alike, it's, they're going to have to. There's going to be a, an adjustment phase where they realize that they have more power to basically customize the game and to be something that they want to do. But uh, I think another thing on top of that, though, is that um, the game's underlying math is is tighter, um, so it'll stay fun for longer. Right, is what I'm saying is is there's not going to be a lot. There's not as many different bonus types, for example. So you're not going to be hunting and pecking through the rule books to find a luck bonus to saving throws or a inside bonus to armor class or stuff like that. Um, instead, you're still going to be able to get powerful, but, but you just won't have to, you, there won't be like this, this, I guess, implication that you can only be powerful if you buy more books and look through more encounters and, or whatever. So I think that'll, that'll be something that people will really, really get into once, uh, once the edition starts getting under, it's getting getting out into the world, I guess. No, I completely agree. I've, I think overall the game feels much tighter and more expandable over time and it feels like a character at 15th level will be just as playable as a character at third level. It doesn't feel, because of the, the very tight math, that it doesn't feel like, yes, that 15th level character is more powerful, but not breaking the game more powerful. It's more powerful in the ways that he's supposed to be. And another, yeah, another thing too that uh, was a problem with second edition or first edition wasn't, and when it was kind of baked in from the 3.5 rules or the third edition rules anyway, is that the more powerful you get, the distance between what you were good at and what you were bad at got so vast. Um, one kind of analogy I like talking about in this that is, um, I guess it was, um, uh, Alternity, back uh, the that science fiction game that Wizards of the Coast published uh, back in like 1999, 2000. It's a really fun game. It's it's uh, um, but it had an element in there, and a lot of science fiction games actually fall prey to this. I I find where the game goes along, goes along, goes along, and everything's fine. But then you get somebody into a suit of power armor, and all of a sudden, that one character is just invulnerable. Nothing else really can touch them. So the GM then has to up the power level so that you can actually challenge the person in power armor. And then all of a sudden, everybody who doesn't have power armor is just crushed. And uh, with the second edition um, uh, Pathfinder, those differences are not so spread out. Um, if you're a 
20th level uh, fighter, for example, you're going to be really good at stabbing people, but you're not going to be completely crippled when it comes to like making your will save or dealing with, uh, you know, flying creatures that are out of range of your attacks or something like that. It's a lot more, I guess, permissive. You're still going to want to, you know, have a, a wide range of, of, of character options in your party to cover, you know, different sorts of threats, but it's not going to be a case of like, the wizard always makes his saving throw against uh, the the domination effect, and the fighter always fails it just because the DCs are so high. Yeah, I mean that's that that's been mentioned many times, but a big aspect is right. It's like at first level, the distance between the fort save and the will save for a fighter is actually better than a fifteenth level, where the fighter is infinitely worse <laughs> at their will saves than their fort saves to the point that it's actually detrimental to their character. Yeah, it's 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 really it was it. It just made it really kind of uh, just hard and frustrating and unpleasing to 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 play once you got to the higher levels, which is is no fun because a lot of the higher level stuff is really where like the climactic encounters and storylines naturally want to you know end up living. So hopefully uh, the 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 new spread will will work, will keep those things viable, but they won't make it feel like one of the things we struggled with actually in the playtest was making things too similar, like. You had a, you had cases where like a wizard, I guess, would uh, at 20th level be almost as good at climbing cliffs as the rogue, simply because they happen to be 20th level. And I think that the, that was a feedback that we got from the play, t- play test that really helped us uh, dial in uh, second edition and make it a much, much better game. Yeah, that's definitely, I think, been taken care of just with the proficiencies, uh, because it went from plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four to plus two, plus four, plus six, plus eight. So if you're, you know, legendary at climbing, you're still going to be way better than someone who's just trained at it. So there's just no way around it. So there's also the element that like these tiers of proficiency, like you can have a plus 40 to a skill, but some skills you just can't do unless you're legendary. So unless you've bought into that, it doesn't matter. You got a plus 40. The person who's plus 20, but legendary will be able to do things that you can't do. So it's it's an unusual sort of way to present uh, what you can and can't do. Oh, there's another thing too. The way that um, uh, critical, su- critical successes and critical failures are built into every role, be it you know, a saving throw or attack roll or a skill check and all that, helps to spread out things that happen in the game. So you can still have spells that that uh, like instantly kill people or, or, or paralyze them or something like that. But by making those elements, you know, something that happens on a critical success or critical failure, it makes them not so prone to ruining, you know, disrupting the storyline as much. Yeah, you definitely have the tiered effect that you especially see that it's most obvious, at least when I read through the rules, is with the trap system, because there's traps and like you have to be master of thievery or you cannot disarm it. I don't care if you're level one and you put all your points in the thievery. Too bad, like you still will not be able to disarm that level seven trap because you're not a master. And you have to have like, you know, as you said, there's like these tier systems. If you don't have the if you don't have um, the proficiency level required to actually make those checks, you can't do it no matter what your skill level is at. And uh, there's an uh, inverse of that, too. Um, One of the things that always kind of bothered me about uh, the uh, first edition Pathfinder was you know, not necessarily the player characters, but all the NPCs in the world, you know, the commoners, the experts, the the um, aristocrats, all these characters. In order for an expert, if you wanted to have like in a small town, somebody that makes a baker that makes apple pies that are so good that when you eat them, you like, it cures diseases and stuff like that. And they're just this this legendary, like, I mean, that's a storyline that you see popping up all the time in, in fantasy uh, tropes and all that stuff. But in first edition Pathfinder, if you wanted to build that just amazing you know, Baker, you had to have like an expert who was like 16th, 17th, 18th level. And all of a sudden that meant that that Baker also had like 300 hit points. And that was kind of goofy. So with second edition, you can make that Baker still be like a first or second level Baker. You just give him legendary baking. And all of a sudden he can do all that sort of stuff without having to be somebody that can like, you know, tank the dragon at the city gates. Now, I do like, again, it's funny, we're almost turning into a Pathfinder 2 discussion at this point. But yes, I do. <laughs> there's, a, there, there's a lot in the rules that I really do like. And uh, I also am about to start a Pathfinder 2 adventure with uh, my gang. So I'm very much looking forward to GMing it, both at Gen Con as well as with my own group on a weekly basis. Actually, the plan is, is that 
we're going to start a new podcast with the fall of plague stone and then probably go into oh, cool. the extinction curse as the next adventure path until I heard that Eric Mona is coming out with his own adventure module in January. And I was like, oh, come on, really? Because Eric has some great adventures. So I'm now I don't know what to do. I, I kind of want to do both because they both come out in January, Extinction Curse and Eric Mona's new adventure. So I'm like, oh, look at what you're doing to me. We, there's not enough hours in the day to play everything. So I always well, think uh, about uh, that. Uh, well, no, I think about that in the retirement home where you talk about this. Like when we go to our retirement home, we're just going to sit around and play Pathfinder all day. That's that's all we're going to do. Everyone's going to be playing poker and, and golf and we're going to be playing Pathfinder. Excellent. Forgot to ask you about your posts. How on earth you have so much time to have you have 61,000 posts on the boards. How the hell do you do that? Uh, the secret is, is that I've been doing it for a long time. I mean. It's it's a uh, you're the, it's the ask James Jacobs anything question thread on Pisa. Um, so I mean, basically, what it is 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 um, you know I'll get to work, I'll get my coffee, uh, sit down, check email, and then I just pop into the thread. And there's like three or four more questions that come in over the day, and I'll just answer them quickly. And then maybe like two or three in the afternoon, I'll pop in just on break or something like that. So it's you know if it's it's basically I view it as part of you know my job duties is just to check that thread and check the threads in general really to to just interact with people um but i don't really i answer maybe like you know a dozen questions a day and it takes maybe 10 or 15 minutes to to answer them unless i get a bee in my bonnet and write a little story or whatever but uh you know that's that builds up pretty quickly just 10 questions a day that's 70 questions a week and then you know hundreds of questions a year well, that's also one probably the most popular thread by far. It's like everyone, even if you don't have a question, everyone just likes to read the Ask James Jacobs All Your Questions Here thread, which how how big is it now? Let's say. Oh, it's it's tens of thousands. I mean, I I mean I'll keep answering questions there as long as people keep asking questions. Um I'm sort of astounded giving like all of how much toxicity there is out there on the internet. I'm kind of astounded that there hasn't been a major sort of I don't know, just trash fire, I guess, in that thread. So that's, I think, a, a testament. 75,758 yeah. comments. Yeah, it's a testament yeah. to how many, how people are basically just so, you know, they're they're mature, they're entertaining, they're, they're, they're there to just talk and ask questions, not there to try to, like, disrupt things, which is kind of nice. Not every thread on, on the internet is like that. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. We could talk forever. And you will not yeah, be thanks. at Con. You're going to be you're going to nope. be at back in Seattle just working, right? Back at the yeah, pretty much. Base. It's uh, it's uh, kind of like uh, having somebody back at the home base who knows where all of the buttons are in case there's an emergency uh, that has to come up. But also, it's a case of like when you go to Gen Con, you know, you lose. You don't just lose the four days that, that the convention has gone. You lose the travel on either side, the setup, the teardown it basically ends up take and then it takes like two weeks or three if you like get the concrud and all of that out of your schedule and um yeah by having a small group of us stay behind we can keep uh keep things going so that we don't fall completely off schedule and so things like you know extinction curse will come out in january and not in like february march april may or june you don't have like any little traditions you have for the left behind people, do you? Like you all go out and party Thursday night or Friday night while everyone's uh, <laughs> slaving away at Gen Con. Uh, we've we've got some. There's there's one where it's like usually on the Friday uh, that Gen Con is happening. You know, the last day of the week, we'll have like a uh, uh, like pizza party type thing at work where everybody gets to order their own pizza and and uh, you still work, but there's pizza all over the place. Um, there's um, other weird things. Like I remember one point, uh, it was like uh, maybe eight, nine years ago where the people who were left behind from Gen Con, they all bought like weird animal head masks and then had a meeting in the meeting room and posted pictures to like Facebook or whatever. It's like the council of animals has taken Paizo over. Or just, I don't know what it was. It was just really weird kind of surreal stuff going on. So. 
You got to do that this year. I want to see Council of Animals reconvene for Pathfinder 2nd Edition. You have so many more ways to distribute that. It doesn't have to be Council of Animals. It could be the Council It's got to be something of, new. Uh, yeah, it's got to be something new. Well, 2nd Edition. So come up with something new. You guys have. Uh, you guys are creative. That's what you do for a living. But you got two weeks to figure this out. Come on, get chopping, chopping. You're in charge there. You know where the buttons are. You can make it happen. Uh, sure. Something will happen. I can guarantee that. <laughs> Something will happen. All right. Well, thanks for coming on the show. I'm sure I'll be talking yeah, to you again yeah. in the near future about some more Paizo products and things announced after Gen Con, I'm sure. Yeah, sounds great. All right. Thanks so much. Hey, everyone. Steve here. So James and I actually kept talking for quite a while. Actually, before that interview even started, he and I were just gabbing on and on. I have a feeling I can get James on the show and he and I can go for at least three or four hours easily. But it's kind of hard to talk about, well, both an adventure path without giving out too many spoilers and the rules, which I really can't talk about too much in detail until August 1st and the release to the world. So we had to kind of temper what we can talk about and sort of talk about it in vague terms but as you can guess both he and I are big fans of the new second edition rule set and when you see it I think you'll know what I mean it's it's very different from the playtest rules it's like kind of similar but very different it's almost like distant cousins if you will you'll see a little bit of the actual flavor from the playtest in there but when it comes down to the nitty-gritty bones of the game itself and how it plays they're night and day and when it comes to creating characters i've actually created several characters so far in pathfinder second edition and i can say it is incredibly robust i think you guys can all really enjoy what you see once again, make sure you stick around the Rule for Combat podcast if you want to hear additional interviews dropping this week and next leading up to Gen Con. We're going to have several interviews with people from Paizo talking about all aspects of Pathfinder 2nd Edition. And don't forget, make sure you check out our podcast, subscribe to us now, and you too will be able to start at the very beginning of the Pathfinder 2nd Edition adventure that we're going to be playing the Fall of Plague Stone by Jason Bowman. All of our characters are going to be starting off at level 1. It's a nice kind of small adventure as opposed to an adventure path where it brings your characters from level 1 to about level 3 or 4 or so. It's approximate, but it'll be a nice self-contained adventure. We can do the actual play. It'll probably take a few months for us to get from beginning to end, but everyone can get an idea of what the rules are like, what the characters are like, and then we'll probably jump in feet first to something like Extinction Curse because I did some development on that. And I got to kill my own guys with the own monsters that I created for a denture path. How great is that? Anyhow, with that, check us out at the website, rollforcombat.com. Check out the Discord channel at discordrollforcombat.com. And do be on the lookout on the Roll for Combat website. We're going to have detailed reviews of the Pathfinder 2nd Edition rules and the Pathfinder Bestiary both dropping on August 1st. So be on the lookout for that. Anyhow, with that, I'll see and talk to you guys later.